Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Nick Axel from Eflux Architecture, and I'll be speaking for the next half hour with Shahar Livne, who is a conceptual material designer based in Eindhoven. So, Shahar, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Yeah, um, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. So, I, I'm, I'd like to speak with you about this lithoplast material that you have on display in the fair. Um, I mean, maybe just to start with the basics, what, what, is, what is lithoplast? What is this material? So the word lithoplast, it comes from uh, ancient Greek. So it lithos uh, means rocks, and uh, plast, it means malleable or can be molded. Mm -hmm. And that's why I also called it like this. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the next stage of uh, plastic glomerate. Mm -hmm. So what happens uh, already in nature is that we have um, pa plastic conglomerate. So it's a naturally occurring uh, plastic rocks. Mm -hmm. Uh, that happens because of uh, heavily saturated sediments with plastic pollution. Mm -hmm. And if you have a heat source, it can be natural heat sources or humans mm -hmm. uh, making fires or burning trash. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes as a glue for natural uh, materials. So it's really the newest type of rock happening on the earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, lithoplast is the next stage. So what will happen? Mm -hmm. Uh, after geological processes and the metabolism of the earth will put forces on it. Mm -hmm. And in thousands of years, how those uh, plastic pollution parts in different environments will change. Mm -hmm. So for example, what I do, I do kind of uh, biomimicry, geomimicry, mm -hmm. um, and I apply a certain type of pressure and, uh, and heat, mm -hmm. um, which is imitating uh, the geological process of metamorphism. Um, I use sediments, which are usually found around plastic pollution in different environments. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, uh, calcium carbonate, uh, which is already used in plastic as a whitener. Mm -hmm. So it's already in the same area or at the bottom of the sea. And I use uh, sediments from really deep in the earth. Mm -hmm. So it's the type of sediments that they... Um, uh, that uh, when we mine for coal, we take them really from deep inside. So mm -hmm. it's quite organic. Mm -hmm and I uh, combine them with the plastic, uh, either plastic that has been spit out from the ocean mm -hmm. or, and being already processed by nature, mm. or uh, with plastic which is landfill designated. So I work with a few recycling companies mm -hmm. and they give me the plastic that they cannot recycle anymore, so they're just gonna get rid of. Huh. But, so, but this process that you've developed can basically take any plastic? Yeah. And that's also what I'm trying to do. I'm doing with every type of plastic. I don't separate them. Mm -hmm. Usually I also find pieces of metal and concrete or glass mm. because it comes from household uh, mm -hmm. products. Um, yeah, because a lot of people ask me what type of plastic are you using? And I don't separate them. I don't even take the time to check which one because mm. in nature you don't have this kind of separation anyway. Yeah. So I just try to be as honest as possible to the natural process. Okay, and um, and in the the material itself is very dark. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's primarily black, but it has like these these flashes of color, which if you look closely, you can kind of see are little pieces of plastic yeah. that are still there. Yeah. So what what is like when we look at this material, what are we looking at? Like what is this kind of black goo that that seems to bind these little plastic things together? So. The idea was uh, because I worked very closely with a geologist when I mm -hmm. wrote my thesis for the graduation project. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that uh, we want us to show kind of like a mid, um, mid metabolism uh, moment. Hmm. So what happened with plastic is that probably it will lose uh, pigments at a certain point. Mm -hmm. And because it's different type of plastic, some of them lose the color and some of them not. So mm -hmm. I really want to show this, that it's like between transformation into fossil fuels again. The, mm -hmm. the idea was that it will carbonize and become again fuel mm -hmm. in a really long time. It's really hard to, to estimate. Even the geologist couldn't tell me like exact time. Mm -hmm. And the idea was really like to show that it's like in this mid metabolism uh, process. Okay, so the, the end state of this will be just kind of this black goo. Yeah. Yeah, that's why what geologists can only assume, of course. Yes. But do we, so are you saying that geologists don't know, like if a piece of plastic was left out, you know, 
in, let's say, a preserved space or something, how long would it take? Like, is there a half-life that it would kind of naturally decompose? So it's really interesting you're saying it because I just read an article a few months ago mm -hmm. that they uh, took biodegradable plastics yep. and they put them in the water oh, and uh, in the earth and they didn't decompose yep. because they need a certain type of uh, environment. Mm. So it's also a misconception that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm researching like the different environments. So for example, mm -hmm. what I say a lot of times is mm -hmm. that we have two different environments we can look at. Mm -hmm. One is landfills, which are uh, designed to mummify everything and protect the environment from the things inside. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that those landfills at some point will break. So yeah. like this protective layer will break, but it mummified. So it already went past the time of what we say plastic can survive. Mm -hmm. So it gives it a longer lifespan. And there were really interesting uh, research about it um, from the University of Arizona, the Coalit Guard Biology. And they really uh, looked at landfills as, as a geologic, uh, uh, sorry, as a uh, archaeological <laughs> site. Yeah. And it was really interesting. I was really inspired by it. And I said, okay, I don't want to uh, really look only at one environment, so only at the ocean, but I also want to look at the burial we do on purpose. Yep. And it's really, we're mummifying plastic on purpose. And it's kind of interesting. But also you have at the bottom of the sea, so it's the plastic that we can't really collect. Mm. Um, it's really a fossilizing environment. It's also the same uh, environment that fossilizes animals. Mm. So it's like uh, minerals and it's encrusting the plastic. Yeah. So I, I know that you, there, there's, a, there's a fiction, there's kind of a, a speculative narrative within this, within this material that I would like to speak about further, but something that you just said made me, made me think you know, if you yourself are mimicking geology, is this not something that could be done at a wider scale as a way to, let's say, actively um, reformulate the waste of plastic that we currently have and to maybe make it into a more usable form? Well, I'm sure I'm open for it, of course, but then I think it misses the point because mm. the idea of like, the idea is that plastic is like, it doesn't care about, it doesn't care about uh, time. Yep. So even if we do that, it still will be there in thousands of years. So the idea of speculative narrative is really to bring it to our time so we can absorb something that it's not absorbable yet. Yeah, but I guess what I'm, what I'm kind of imagining here is, I mean, you're, you're, you've created a new building material yep. almost, right? So, you know, maybe it's not about getting rid of the plastic because we can, you can't get rid of material. It either goes to the air or the soil, yeah, right? Good. But what if it's about, I mean, if this is a super durable material, like what if we started making bricks out of this? Yeah, what if we started, not? you know, making buildings out of this? I wonder that that might be a way to at least like keep the waste somewhere that it doesn't pollute. Yeah, that's the thing that I, um, well, I'll, I'll, again, I'll be very open for it because it's a very interesting material. But again, it's um, this idea of like telling people that plastic is, is not affected by time. So even mm. if we use it in the present, it doesn't matter because it will just go through uh, those same processes, if not now, then in, in 100 years. Mm. So even if you use it for a building material, yeah. it still will be there in thousands of years. Yeah. But, but, that, but I guess what I'm saying is like that could be great. Yeah. Right? I mean, think of the buildings that we have, you know, from thousands of years ago. These are kind of our, you know, our most valued and cherished, you know, m monuments to yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Uh, actually, it could be very interesting to use it as a monument maybe for, for our time because it is a marker of the Anthropocene. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But so... Thank you for the good idea. <laughs> oh, you're, you're welcome. Um, but do, do you, um, I mean, do you, do you think that we will stop using plastics eventually? So the idea was um, what is called uh, peak oil, is that yep. fossil fuels, uh, fossil oils are, um, uh, are renewable resources, but it takes them really thousands and millions of years. So it's not something which we can immediate renew. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the idea is that we're already kind of in peak oil or we're even past it. Yep. So at some point we're going to get out of uh, raw material to make new plastic. Mm. So the only way we can deal, it, deal with it is recycling. But if you recycle mm. and recycle at some point, it's downcycling. Mm. It's really hard to do upcycling without a raw material, uh, a virgin material taking part in plastic recycling. Yeah. So at some point it's kind of clear that we're going to run out of it. Mm. Um, and it's only going to be found as a part of nature. Mm -hmm. But so if, is, is this process that you're creating with lithoplast not kind of accelerating that downcycling process? I mean, if, if you downcycle enough, do you get to the raw material? I don't know. That's about chemical uh, engineering. I'm not okay. a chemical engineer. Sure. Um, I'm just trying to, to create an invitation to create a kind of a gaze into the future. So mm -hmm. it's not really about the process of recycling, but it's more about like perspective. And, and along with the perspective, would you also say that it's something about an aesthetic in the sense that like we treat plastic as something that is somewhat, I mean, Artificial doesn't really capture it, but it's somewhat removed from us mm -hmm. because I, I feel like what this work is doing is it's it's kind of revealing its proximity to us and its intimacy to us. So it's and and the fact that you know it can be construed potentially as beautiful yeah. is to say like yes, we should be welcoming this into our lives in a different way. Yeah, definitely, I completely agree with you. One of the <clears throat> of the angles that I take in this research is this. Um, that we now we treat plastic in a very uh, remote thing, very industrial material, but it's changing. I'm also going to talk about it in the panel that it became kind of a, um, a raw material that we take to our homes and we start to craft with. You see a lot of videos of people on the internet that they remelt it and they craft out of it as if it was wood or, um, or stone. And I saw this kind of uh, shift in, in relation to plastics, and I took it uh, further in this idea that the moment it transform also through nature and become a hybrid natural material, yeah. also our relationship with it is changing. As, mm -hmm. The same as we work with clay, it's a very intimate material. And that's why I also refer to it as kind of like a new natural resource yeah. that we mine and we craft with, because mm -hmm. I wanted to change this perspective. Is, are there any issues with toxicity? So the idea, the thing with ocean plastic, uh, from what I read and what I researched, is that they act kind of like a magnet for uh, toxins. Um, huh. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit scary because I also worked with this material. Well, but, but wait, by that do you mean that they like attract yeah. other toxins? Yeah, they attract other toxins. So almost as like a cleaning device? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if it's cleaning, but I know that they become okay. quite toxic. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I don't want to say something that I'm not really sure, sure about. Sure, sure, sure. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, so this material is toxic. I, I also, when I work with it, I try to be very careful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I, I was always told as a child, you know, like, don't burn plastic. Yeah, don't burn right? plastic. Because the fumes are not good. And that's also the thing about petroleum. It's like, it is a highly toxic material. It yeah. poisons our landscapes when it, when it, when it, is, you know, in pollution studies called like out of place. Yeah, yeah, it's really, also in the movie of our uh, installation, mm -hmm. you can see a refinery factory. And uh, when my partner filmed it, he said, oh, it was smelled so bad. <laughs> it was really horrible. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they create uh, polyethylene in this mm -hmm. factory as well. Mm -hmm. So it's also like uh, a pollution, which is, uh, yeah, it's more air pollution as well. Wait, polyethylene, what, what is? What it's is a it? type of plastic that they create. Ah, okay. Okay. It's a refinery for uh, oils and they uh, create yeah. plastics as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, there is the issue of toxi uh, toxicity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so when I work with it, of course, I try to be careful. Yeah. Um, the uh, the factories, like the recycling factories I work with, they they kind of like say it's not a problem because you're not burning it, but you're melting it hmm. because it's a melting process. Hmm. Metamorphism starts about 200 degrees, so it's not that bad. Okay. Uh, it's not really burning. Yeah. Uh, they keep saying it's okay. <laughs> I, I'm a bit scared, so i just being cautious anyway. But yeah, this, pla this material is toxic, of course, but there is a lot of toxic materials uh, in the earth anyway. Absolutely, yeah. So it doesn't really, I don't think it's a big issue in this project. Yeah, as long as, it's, as, long as that kind of safety is designed within the... Yeah, and that's maybe process. why it's interesting to go back to your other question about building materials mm. and uh, really using it or seeing like if we're using it right now, 
maybe now it will be toxic, but when it goes through the earth processes, it will lose its uh, toxicity. Yeah. And I mean, plastics have been used in architecture since, you know, since at least the 60s, if yeah. not earlier, right? I mean, yeah. and and it was one of like the defining features of like Italian design in the in 60s and 70s, right? Yeah. To use plastics to create a new aesthetic out of yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. And exactly. I mean, there, there of course are these issues with off-gassing, right? Yeah. Because, um, you know, there are some materials like, um, like reprocessed wood, um, it just off gases formaldehyde, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, which is highly toxic, and it, and it has an effect on your on on the way that you perceive the world. It yeah. really messes with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but there but you know I think that these are tests that that could be quite valuable to do because if you know this is going to be a raw material, mm -hmm. you know let's also like really think about what its potentials are, like what are its properties? Yeah, definitely. You know, what definitely. sorts of spaces can it be suitable for? Yeah, definitely. I, I think also now because I work more in, um, in the object uh, area, so I don't really go to the architecture field, but it could be a good potential. Um, I would like to go even deeper into the chemical properties of it, of course. Mm. So I'm always looking for people who would like to uh, collaborate with me and yeah. more specialists because, of course, as a designer, how much can I do? <laughs> I'm sure. a, I'm only one person, so. Yeah, but I mean, at uh, you know, at some design weeks in Eindhoven, right? They have displays of new materials. Yeah. Right, and and there is this kind of there's this entire kind of legal apparatus for testing new materials, mm -hmm. and yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I really. I really hope that you can that you that you can find certain people to work with that yeah. allow you to really figure out you know like what are what are the properties of yeah, this. Yeah, I hope so. I've yeah. been in touch with a few, but uh, nothing really came out yet. So yeah. I hope in the future. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think it's. I, I understand that I'm maybe like projecting some of my own desire here, but I think this narrative that you're crafting of kind of a future archaeology that like mm -hmm. this is, these are the natural resources of 1,000 years. Yeah. I mean, there's also some people saying that actually like nuclear waste yeah. is a resource, yeah, yeah. right? We just need to wait a little bit for yeah. it. Yeah, it's and, gonna be also a marker of the Anthropocene. Yeah, but I think it's it's an incredibly powerful narrative. And so in, in my tendency as an architect, I may be just like, all right, mm -hmm. Kind of build a building out of yeah, this, right? Yeah, let's build a building. Let's, let's do, you know, like let's really use this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why not? Why yeah, not? like let's let's bring that future closer. Yeah, we can do that. Of course, I'm 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 always um, uh, very pro uh, when you go into design narrative to look in the past, in the present, and in the future, and to go between them. So yeah. it's not a one fixed uh, timeline, of course. But I mean, do you say that you're you're more in kind of the object scale? Do you ever? see this material being uh, like brought onto a market? Uh, I've been asked a few times uh, mm. by interior designers mm. uh, because it's a part of a few uh, material libraries. So mm -hmm. of course they see an interesting material and they immediately mm. ask me, oh, can we have a sample? We want to try. Mm. But the thing is that I'm trying to be quite protective of it mm. because I don't want it to lose its value as a speculative material. Mm. And I think that's also what makes mm. people really um, uh, find it special and interesting and really relate to the story mm -hmm. because if it was very common I think it would kind of lose track yeah. of the of the concept So I'm at the moment. I'm being a bit protective of the integrity of the mm -hmm. speculative design Okay, and now I mean can I ask you a bit more about these material libraries you just mentioned? I don't know how much time we have left um, but yeah these material libraries, so how did this end up in a in a material library? So I think material libraries, for them it's very important uh, to be up to date on all kinds of materials which are out there. So it's not necessarily mm. for consumers. Mm. Um, I also have other materials that I'm working on in material libraries. Mm -hmm. So they just uh, ask me if I can send them a sample. And yeah. uh, I think it's really interesting because uh, you have different ones. You have mm -hmm. university material libraries, mm -hmm. which is more for the students to get inspired by. Yeah. And you have the more commercial ones, like Material Connection in uh, New York. And they also hold uh, two different materials for me. So the Little Plus, but also another one that I'm working with. Hmm. Um, and they work more with companies. So hmm. I don't, I think it's nice because it's more like it can be inspiring for companies. And also the idea of this, uh, of this uh, concept is like to inspire uh, like individuals, but also bigger companies that works with materials or create new materials to think deeper when they create a new material and not think only in the immediate time, but also in a bigger scale. Yeah. 
Uh, so that's why I'm happy that material libraries take it, because even though I get those uh, asking uh, people asking me, oh, I'm an interior designer and I want to have a sample of your pro of your material, mm. I'm still happy that materials uh, that material libraries get it because I think mm. they they show it and they present it. Also, materia uh, materia district in uh, the Netherlands, it's mm. a quite a big library, and. Um, yeah, it's really good because then companies can also be influenced by it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting position. This uh, as uh, this title that you give yourself, a conceptual material yes. designer, yes. right? And it and I mean, you know, the like critical theorists of the 20th century have a lot to say about what happens when you commercialize something, yeah. and how it kind of turns it, how it makes it fall flat. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess if as so long as it as it kind of inspires other ways of of thinking and looking, because. Yeah. You know, you might not necessarily want just someone to point at the wall and say, you know, it's it's this it's this entire idea of like green consumerism, yes. right? To say like, look, I'm buying, you know, sustainably, uh, you know, sourced and produced goods, but you're still sourcing, yeah. right? It's still it's still. I'm like, very critical so. about the word sustainability yeah. because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it's really possible to be 100% sustainable, yeah. and also with my other project, um, which I work with uh, slaughterhouse waste. Mm. Uh, I get a lot of critique about it. Mm. And I say, yeah, but you need to understand that uh, systems, they work in a very big way. Mm. So I look at systems. I don't look at good or bad. I don't look at the white or black. Mm -hmm. I think you can't be 100% sustainable. I'm a bit critical about this term. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think it's a very uh, healthy form of, of, of criticality. Yeah. But I think it's also, it's a very important position that you're taking that it's not about saying whether something is good or bad is to say like it is mm -hmm. and there are you know there are certain things that get used and then there are yeah. other things that have you know abject consequences yeah everything right? has a consequences yeah but everything. but it, but it seems like what you're maybe doing is you're trying to find ways to use those consequences yeah and and to make them not so consequential anymore i don't i think it's not about like giving that's also a thing that I don't want to make people think, oh, then it's okay that I throw this plastic in the mm. ocean because anyway, it's going to be part of the earth. That's mm. also something mm. that I'm dealing with yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. But it's the idea is like to more to uh, invite people to discuss this. Mm. It's more like to lay down the whole system mm. and not just say, oh, this is my opinion and I'm going with it. I'm trying not to take like one stand, but I'm yeah. trying to be more like what Foucault is calling heterotopia. So yeah. it's not dystopia or uh, utopia, but heterotopia. So it's yeah. the difference. And I, I'm curious, what have the discussions been like around this material with uh, the people that you work with at landfills? So they actually are quite happy about it because uh, for them, they try to be more, um, they're pro-plastic, of course. <laughs> so for them, it's yeah. nice that somebody is not really anti-plastic. Yeah. Um, they're very happy to donate for it, of course, because for them it just lost money, so mm -hmm. they just give it to me anyway, because otherwise it just goes mm -hmm. into a landfill. Yeah. Um, I spoke to a few, uh, it's actually interesting you're saying it, because when I was uh, part of the New Material Award in the Netherlands, one of the judges, she's a, a chemical engineer, mm. and she works with plastic, and she said to me uh, after the award ceremony, she said, yeah, I think plastic is really great. So. That's kind of what I'm trying to apply to a wider audience. I don't want to speak only to people who think it's bad or to people who think it's good, but I want them to come together and talk about it in a new way. No, I mean, I know that we're, we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm curious now to, to think further about like your relationship with the industry. Um, how does what you're proposing differ from other forms of recycling of plastic? So first of all, I'm not recycling. <laughs> well, okay, so then how, but how, but how does it differ? Or, well, yeah. there, of course, there are beautiful projects, which I really appreciate, like Precious Plastic is an amazing project. Mm -hmm. And I think what is uh, the main point of recycling is to, lose, to use less virgin material or mm -hmm. to, uh, to be able to extract things which went um, uh, to the environment and reuse them again, put them back in the consumer, in the mm -hmm. cycling of mm -hmm. consumerism. Um, I'm trying to be a bit outside of that stain mm -hmm. uh, because I don't want to, I'm not recycling again. Yeah. Um, I'm more showing something which is very natural. Yeah. So I'm showing a natural system. I'm not uh, trying to be part of the consumerism system. Mm. I'm just trying to look into something more natural. Okay. Okay. 
yeah. Cool. That's that's maybe a good time to stop. So yeah. thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank and, you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to. I mean, it was a really great conversation. I look forward to being in touch with you more about this. Uh, yeah, I would love about to. this later. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>